In this video, we're going to talk about three different bacterial infections, pretty common here in the United States. The first one I want to talk about is strep throat. When adults have a sore throat, tonsillopharyngitis, it is 90% of the time viral, which means that you do not need antibiotic because antibiotics do not work on uh, viral diseases. So um, how can you tell if you have strep throat or not? You can take your phone light, you can look in the mirror, and you know if it's a bright red, most likely it's viral, but if you have uh, white exudates, so the white spots back there on the tonsils, as you can see on the bacterial side, and the tonsils are swollen, uh, the uvula will kind of be swollen. Sometimes you'll have a gray, furry tongue. So if it looks like that, you need an antibiotic because there can be complications if you don't. So um, symptoms of sore th uh, strep throat. This would include what we just saw, uh, swollen lymph nodes. You can see in the picture, that's kind of where you would feel around and see if you could feel those lymph nodes. You have constitutional symptoms like fever, body aches. Um, you can have, in this case, with strep throat, you do not have a cough typically. And sometimes you can have a rash and um, obviously a sore throat. It's called strep, strep throat because it's the bacterium that causes it is called Streptococcus pyogenes. Strepto means chain. Uh, caucus means spherical, so you can see it's a straight chain of spherical uh, bacteria, and they're gram positive, which means when you do a gram stain, they have that thick peptidoglycan cell wall, and it will absorb that violet stain, and so it'll appear purple if it's a gram stain bacteria or a po gram positive bacteria. So here's an actual look under a microscope, most likely at about a thousand times magnification. You can see the straight chains of spherical bacteria staining purple. All right. Um, so they have a, a, a strep test that they can take and get pretty quick feedback. And it looks for these proteins in the cell membrane or cell wall. A more accurate test is to actually grow it out, which takes a while. You can even throw some uh, different antibiotic disc on the auger and see if you get that zone around it where uh, you can tell how well it works. So that's called the rapid strep test. It only has a 60 to 8, 80% sensitivity. So that means that um, 20 to 40% of the time you have strep throat, it may not pick up on it, but it is quick. So um, its specificity is really high. So if you do test positive for it, there's a good chance that you have it. And it almost looks like a pregnancy test there. And then you, the throat culture is 100% sensitive or almost. So um, that really confirms it. It just takes a little while and it's nice to get on those antibiotics early. You can get, this happens more in kids, but you can get scarlet fever caused by the exotoxins from the bacteria. And you can get these different rashes in different areas. We treat strep throat with penicillin. Penicillin uh, is going to um, affect the cell wall of, you know, uh, it has to be a gram positive bacteria. And we are good. We don't have too many side effects from penicillin because um, we don't have cell walls in our cells. However, we do have some good bacteria in our, our gut that may succumb to the antibiotics, which you'd always want to take probiotics along with it. Really cool story on how Alexander Fleming found this by accident. Um, he just noticed some mold growing in a bacterial culture and around the mold growing. There was a zone of inhibition where you didn't see any bacteria growing. And he said, hmm, maybe they, maybe this mold produces something that kills the bacteria. If you don't take antibiotics, you can have a greater risk of complications. Rheumatic fevers, one. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of it, but this usually happens about two weeks after the actual um, strep throat uh, begin because these antibodies build up and these antibodies will actually, it's almost like an autoimmune situation where they'll attack some of our joints and different organs and, and cause some problems. Another one, those antibodies can cause problems in these delicate capillaries in our kidneys. And these capillaries are called glomeruli. So it's called glomerulonephritis, which means inflammation of the glomeruli in the kidney because nephro is referring to kidney. So those are just a couple of complications that can occur due to the antibodies several weeks after you get strep throat, especially if you don't treat it with antibiotics. This is, has another cool story behind it. Um, so for the longest time, uh, physicians believe and scientists believe that bacteria couldn't live in the stomach because you have that, that really low pH um, that bacteria can't live in. And there was this doctor named Barry Marshall, and he, was, uh, he practiced in Australia. And he, you know, working with uh, another scientist or doctor there, they realized that they find this bacteria uh, with a lot of peptic ulcers in the stomach and in the duodenum, the very first part of the stomach. You can actually see it there coming off the bottom of the stomach. And um, they forever thought it was stress. And you may have even heard, heard of this years ago. You know, don't, don't cause yourself an ulcer getting stressed out. That's actually not the cause. You can have all the stress you want. That's not going to produce an ulcer. But what is going to produce an ulcer is the majority of the time a bacteria called Heliobacter pylori, H. pylori, which has a little pili that can latch on to the gastric wall and it thrives in that low pH and it can actually begin to wear away the, the wall of the, the stomach or the duodenal of the intestines and wear a hole through it where you would have to have, you know, deal with the, the internal hemorrhaging and the, um, possibly have surgery. Another cause is uh, NSAIDs. So like COX inhibitors, um, like celecoxib, diclofenac, ibuprofen, all these different NSAIDs, you know, um, some people say, you may have heard people say, I can't take too much ibuprofen, it, it irritates my stomach. Uh, that's because it blocks prostaglandins that cause pain, but it also blocks prostaglandins that play an integral role in providing that uh, mucosal layer um, barrier in the stomach. So going back to Barry Mitchell, um, they couldn't prove in rats that this was the cause of an ulcer. and that it, but that's because this only occurs in primates. And he took one for the team and actually drank a broth of H. pylori bacteria and ended up getting gastritis and showing that it was the underlying cause of peptic ulcers. And so now they can give you uh, amoxicillin, that's the pink stuff you may have when you're a kid, or uh, clithromycin. These antibiotics will actually do a good job of clearing these up. And that was revolutionary because before there was no cure if you had an ulcer. They just tried to, you know, give you different things to help buffer that acid that, that caused discomfort. The third type of bacteria or bacterial infection we're going to discuss is otitis media, which is just the fancy term for uh, middle ear infection. And this is, this can be caused by, you know, having some kind of, infection in the nose, this especially prevalent in younger kids. In fact, 85% uh, of, of children under the age of three have this infection. And you can see the different, these are the eardrums, the pictures down there. The one on your left, as you look at the screen, is a normal eardrum. And then the one on the right, you can see is really inflamed and red. And that's because it's uh, infected. This is uh, this is what you uh, the pediatrician. Sixty percent of pediatrician 
visits are to, you know, use an otoscope and look in the ear and see if it's red like that. A good pediatrician will not give antibiotics right away because a lot of these are viral and a lot of them, even if they're bacterial, will clear up in seven to 10 days. And this is something my wife and I would battle because, you know, she would want to get the antibiotic and I'm trying to preserve our daughter's um, good bacteria. And, you know, if you take amoxicillin, it's going to kind of wreak havoc in the intestines as far as, I mean, it may kill the help kill the bacteria, but it's also going to kill some of the good bacteria in the gut, which is so important for so many things. The reason you see a lot of younger kids have this is because they have the eustachian tube that goes from their nasal cavity to the middle ear. It, it's, it's more horizontal. And you can imagine if you had a in sinus infection, uh, you know, in adults, it's usually confined to the nasal cavity because we have this incline up to the middle ear. But in younger kids, uh, there's more horizontal. And so uh, they have it in their their nasal cavity, they're on their side. You can imagine it just kind of making its way through that, that continuous mucosa all the way to the middle ear. And uh, so my daughter's sick. She's never had an antibiotic. Um, whenever she, she did have quite a few ear infections, but I bought a otoscope and it's real easy to tell if it's inflamed or not. And if it were to persist for more than 10 days, I would definitely get her on an antibiotic. But we would just, uh, as soon as she would get to sleep, build her up where she was kind of sitting upright as she slept to try to keep that from that fluid from getting into the middle ear and it would clear up. We would just kind of um, give her medications for the symptoms as needed. So there's, there's several different bacteria that can cause uh, ear infections. One of the most common is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And it's known because it also causes pneumonia and, you know, bacterial infection of the lungs. But you, you can see there's a couple of them there. The one that's pictured to the right is the dip, gram-negative diplococcus. So uh, these are treated with amoxicillin and the penicillin family. So, again, that one's going to get the, that big, big, thick peptidoglycan cell wall and gram-positive bacteria.